Hey guys, Colin here, hope you're well. Today we're gonna to be looking at a really interesting sample to get our teeth into. We're gonna be looking at extracting shell code from fileless malware. What does that even mean? Well, fileless malware, in this case, we have a Word document which has got some malicious VBA code, so it's got some macro code, and within the macro code is some shell code which gets injected into the memory space of another process. Uh, so it kind of hijacks another process, injects the memory, injects the, uh, the kind of the shell code into that memory space, uh, and then that victim process then ends up running the malware so everything happens within the context of memory nothing actually touches the disk therefore it's classed as fileless malware and it's super effective for the bad guys to infect machines in this particular way because uh, kind of conventional methods of detection such as antivirus are usually looking for um, suspicious file activity on your disk well in this case it doesn't touch the disk therefore uh, they can evade a lot of uh, different mechanisms which we use to detect this kind of malware um, the bad news for the bad guy though however is that because this only exists in the context of memory as soon as you reboot your machine they lose their persistence they don't have any uh, kind of uh, post reboot persistence mechanisms and therefore your machine uh, becomes uh, uh, not infected anymore so this is the sample we're going to take a look at I'm going to show you how to extract the shell code we're going to then perform some static analysis on the shell code and then perform some advanced dynamic analysis on it and you can see exactly what's going on under the hood uh, and actually identify where this shell code came from in the first place so this is a word doc I've got it on a Windows 10 VM here I've just got uh, Process Hacker up and going in the background as well. I'm not going to enable the content on the macros just yet, but we are going to take a poke around and just so we can kind of talk through it uh, and understand what's going on. So we can see here some aliases being defined um, at the top of the code here. So there's four aliases for four different API uh, calls from the kernel 32 library. And these uh, four API calls are the recipe for process injection. So we have uh, create process A, write process memory, virtual alloc X, and also create remote thread. So not necessarily used in that order, um, but anyway, when, when actually combined in the right way, you can create a new process, you can inject your code, you can allocate memory in that process, and then you can inject and write your process um, code, write your code into that process, and then you can actually create the remote thread and set it off and running uh, and executing in the context of that victim process. So super interesting way of actually executing malware. Um, here is the, the kind of main function that we're interested in. It's, it's called auto open, um, and this function is going to be um, executed on, on the when the workbook opens. So I'm just going to disable that mechanism. Uh, and what we see here is there's an array here of shellcode bytes uh, represented in integer format. And there's some negative values which we'd need to take into account for our two's complement mathematics to, to kind of work out the hexadecimal representation of those, um, those uh, integer values. We've got some zero values and there's obviously some positive values in there as well. Uh, but fairly short array of, uh, of, of digits. Uh, however, that all equates to some super dangerous dangerous malware which we need to extract and analyze and understand exactly what's going on with it. We see a string here called sproc which is being defined which is the victim process which is run dll32.exe and then just depending on what Windows environment you're in it's just going to build the string for the right uh, folder for where that file actually exists uh, and then it's going to execute the first alias which is run stuff so it's going to create process A so it's actually going to create the run dll32 process it's then going to alloc stuff which is virtual alloc x it's going to allocate enough space to take that particular particular array in that process, uh, in the victim process of RunDLL32. And then it's going to iterate through a for loop here. Uh, so it's going to go from the lower bound of the array to the upper bound of the array and write each individual byte into the memory space of that process it's just created. And then finally, it's going to call create stuff. So that's going to call create remote thread, which is then going to execute the uh, the actual uh, victim process, which has now got my shell code embedded into it. So therefore, the shell code is going to execute in memory as well. So I'm going to comment that code out just for now because I don't actually want it to execute. What we could actually do if you wanted some super quick indicators is you copy this uh, information out this uh, all of these the uh, the, uh, uh, the integers from the array copy them out and actually we can convert them into ASCII representation so I've just copied them into a text editor and I've just got rid of the uh, line continuation characters from Visual Basic and what we can do is we can put them into CyberChef for example a tool which I love to use for all sorts of different conversions and um, we can convert them from decimal um, although it doesn't like it because there's negative values in there but we do get uh, some ASCII representation of the of those particular values and we see here what looks to be uh, a network indicator 
So we've got some kind of IOC here that we can use to protect against in our environment. So that seems to be hard coded into the actual shell code. Um, be interesting to see whether the shell code is designed to do other stuff as well. Uh, so we'll, we'll keep going. Um, one of the things we could also do is because we know it uses specific API calls, we could actually use API monitor. Um, and API monitor, I know a lot of people on my feed uh, like this tool. It's not a tool I use a great deal of a monitor review, but you can use um, API monitor to filter out for specific API calls and you can monitor whatever processes you like on your system or, or services for that matter for any uh, references to those APIs and you can kind of debug and poke around the process and see what it's doing at that time. So we'll monitor the WinWord process for that call to write process memory. Um, what I'm just going to do then is I'm going to enable my macros uh, just so I've got the, uh, the code active. Uh, that's saved, that's good. Um, I'm making sure that I'm not going to actually um, create the thread just now. It's going to kind of pause when I've got this um, process created in its suspended state and we can kind of poke around and see what's going on. So I'm going to press F5. And that's going to get the code going. You can see here in uh, Process Hacker, I've now got a child process which is in a suspended state. We know it's suspended because it's in gray in Process Hacker and also because the parameter of four was passed into uh, the actual uh, call to run stuff or create process A, which means create this process in a suspended state. If we flip back to API monitor, we see uh, it's actually managed to pick up on all of the individual calls to write process memory throughout the course of that for loop, which is iterated over every single entry in that array. And we can see here, have a look in the hex buffer. So we see here uh, there's FC, then there's E8, and then there's 89. So this is the, uh, the hexadecimal representation of the byte values which are being injected into that process. We see some zeros, 60, 89, 85, blah, 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 and it goes on and on and on right the way through uh, the, the, uh, the course of that array. So that's great, but actually what we want to do is we want to extract all of those bytes together ourselves uh, so we can perform some additional analysis, right? So let me come out of um, API Monitor because we don't kind of need it now. Uh, Microsoft Word is, uh, is complaining it needs to restart and we'll let it do that. That's fine, no problems, probably because I was monitoring the process. So we're going to terminate run DLL32 uh, just to kind of get rid of it and we'll start from a clean slate. Let me open back up Microsoft Word. Uh, we'll go back into the actual code. Hopefully it's, it's still going to be uh, commented out as we uh, as we had it last time. It is, and therefore we can kind of poke around what's going on here. So what we can actually do is we can copy out, uh, we can write a bit of code ourselves. And I'm going to kind of copy and paste this from stuff I prepared earlier just in the interest of time, uh, but I will talk you through it just now. Uh, so we can we can actually create our own uh, version, if you like, of the, of the same for loop. So we've got the same array here, and I'm going to iterate over the array in, in the context of a for loop um, and all I'm going to do instead of um, you know injecting it into a process I'm actually just going to convert it to a hexadecimal value and then going to um, make sure it's of length 2 um, just to spit out the correct format for hexadecimal representation and then I'm just going to write it to an output file which is a text a text folder a, sorry a text file on my desktop here and I've just created that a particular text uh, file by using a file system object create text file and pass it the string of the file that I what you want to create. So if I press F5 and run that particular macro, hopefully what I'll get now is on my desktop output.txt and we have a load of uh, a load of hexadecimal bytes if you like or byte values uh, which are in my text file. Well that's cool. Now what we can do is we can stick that uh, into a, um, a hex editor so we can create a new file in a hex editor, paste that information in and here we see um, the same stuff that we saw, the hard-coded stuff that we saw from uh, CyberChef just earlier on. This is the same network indicator which is hard-coded into the shellcode. So that's cool. What we can do is save this as a, as a file. We'll call this shellcode.bin and that's great. Now we've, we're in a stage where we can start performing some additional analysis. However, we can't yet um, kind of put this in a debugger because it's only, it is only the raw shellcode, right? So what we need to do is actually make this shellcode into some kind of executable. And luckily, now I'm going to flip over to my uh, Linux VM here. Uh, let me just navigate to my uh, navigate to my desktop. Uh, luckily, there is a piece of uh, awesome code called shellcode to exe.py. Now, it's a Python script, so you can use this on multiple different architectures. It just so happens to be that I've got it installed on my Remnux machine, uh, and therefore uh, I'm using it in Linux. But you can feed it uh, shellcode.bin, and you can output shellcode.exe and it will convert or not or not necessarily convert but put a wrapper around your shellcode and create it into an executable file one which you, you can then um, let me just copy this back to my host uh, and that will enable me to then copy this back over to my windows machine uh, and that enables us now to stick that into the likes of x64 or whatever debugger that you choose uh, okay cool let me uh, escape from uh, ntdll 
we're now at the start, the entry point of our shell code, and we can kind of poke around the shell code now uh, in its uh, assembly format and find out exactly what's going on under the hood. The first thing that sticks out to me here is this particular call, just a few instructions away from the actual entry point. We see here that uh, we've got XOR, EDX, EDX, so therefore EDX is going to be zero. Uh, then we have EDX plus 30, so that's going to be 30 because EDX is zero. So we're going to move FS, uh, FS30 into, into EDX. Well, FS30 uh, is the, um, the memory offset location for the process environment block, otherwise known as the PEB. Uh, why is the malware doing this? Well, it needs to know where it is, right? So it's just a piece of kind of shell code which is floating in memory, uh, and we're going to throw it into the memory space of another process. Well, the, the, the actual shell code needs to work out where it is in memory, and one of the things it can do, it can look for um, the static kind of address of FS30 uh, for the, in the process environment block, and then it can use that to traverse through the PEB and work out where kernel 32 is once it can work out where kernel 32 is, it can then work out where the necessary um, API calls exist in memory that it needs in order to perform the additional functions of the malware. So it's a real cool, kind of cool trick that the malware uses to find where it actually exists within the file system. And it first does that by looking up itself, finding out where, um, you know, with the name of the, the current module uh, and then traversing the PEB and looking for the loader to um, the, the kernel 32 base and et cetera, it kind of goes through the, uh, the uh, down the rabbit hole to find out exactly what it needs to find out. So that's that's really interesting actually. And we can see here there's a comparison for the letter A for whatever reason. That's probably and we can see actually just out of interest uh, we can see some addition. Uh, we can see a subtraction here from uh, AL. So a comparison for A. Um, to, to whatever's in AL, which is the lower portion of the EAX register. Uh, and then we can see here that if it's lower than, it will jump to this location, uh, and then we'll actually subtract 20. So that's actually gonna convert it to, to an uppercase value. Um, so that's that's interesting because it looks like it's, it's doing some string manipulation straight away off the bat. Um, and we got the, you know, as soon as I, I kind of see some assembly code, all I kind of do before I start executing it and running through it is actually just poke around it a little bit and see whether there's anything of interest here, uh, which we, we might be able to actually use and even we can look for open source intelligence techniques to, to identify what the malware is doing. So keep poking around, we could step through this line by line if we wanted to, but I see here there's a push of a particular value. In fact, there's a few values which get pushed and then there's a call to EVP. That's, that's interesting, um, you know, we don't often see that. And we, in fact, we also see some more static values here. So I'll tell you what we can do is we can just take one of these and if you see, um, you know, assembly code, which, you know, looks a bit, little bit unique and looks a little bit, um, you know, like it might be bespoke to this particular piece of malware or, or just kind of sticks out a little bit, why don't we just Google it and see what happens, right? So we can do, we can Google the push to that particular a hexadecimal address. So if we just put a zero X in front of it, uh, which is how most people would represent hexadecimal, but X64 takes the zero X prefix out, we actually see the top hit in Google is to Metasploit framework, DNS underscore text query exec dot Ruby. Uh, so let's have a look at this particular code and see whether or not we can find any familiarity here. We can see this is a Metasploit module. Uh, this is a payload and it's a DNS tech, text record payload download and execution. Performs a text query against a series of DNS records and then will execute the return payload. So this is sounding super dangerous and, and something we definitely don't want in our environment. And if we have a look here, we can see the same kind of code that we saw just before, right? So we see get a pointer to the PEB. So we see XOR EDX EDX, we get FS30 uh, and also um, we see uh, as well, you know, traversing the PEB to find uh, exactly where it is in memory. They compare for A um, against AL, jump if, if, uh, if it's not lowercase, uh, then subtract 20 from AL and therefore it's going to normalize it to uppercase, etc, etc, etc. So if we have a look for actually uh, what we saw in, um, in the strings themselves, here's the push to that particular value. And um, we can see here, push a pointer to the DNS API string on the stack. Well, that's, um, you know, very demonstrative of, of um, you know, exactly what this obviously module is designed to do, perform some kind of DNS lookups. Um, and we can kind of, let's flip back to our malware. So we, we've kind of identified what this malware is and, and almost instruction for instruction, um, you know, this is identical to what we're seeing here on GitHub. So push, to, push ESP followed by another push of uh, what is uh, commented here in the code as, uh, as load library from kernel 32, uh, but 726774C, uh, we see exactly the 
the same thing here uh, within our code as well. So we're seeing artifacts from our particular shell code being represented uh, in open source intelligence and we've actually identified what this shell code is. It's a Metasploit payload which is um, communicating over DNS back to the bad guy. So that's pretty interesting. Um, okay, so what we can do is, is obviously step through the code and kind of set a few breakpoints. Um, interestingly enough here, one of the things which kind of sticks out at me uh, when, I'm, when I'm scrolling through here is we've got Z and A or Z and A, uh, another Z and A, another Z and A. Um, and these are comparisons that are being made. So we can see here that there's a comparison to, to BL, which is the lower portion of the EBX register, and it's comparing it to the letter, to the letter Z. Um, and that's interesting. And then if, there's, if it's lower or what have you, it's going to jump to this particular location. Um, so what we can do, let's breakpoint on this, and then we can press F9 and run the malware, uh, and we can start kind of step through and see um, what's going on here. We see in the EDX register, there's um, reference to the, to the WS, so the WinSocket 32 DLL. Um, let's keep going and press F9. There we see the same um, C2 indicator in the, stored in the EAX register that we saw within um, our um, our strings in memory as well. Uh, so in fact, while we're doing that, let me let me fire up DNS query um, uh, sniffer, which is a fantastic piece of software from Nursoft. If you ever get a chance to uh, to browse their website, they've got a huge amount of tools, which is super useful. And this will kind of log all of the DNS queries for us. So let's keep going. Press F9. We can see the next thing that happens is the the actual um, the, the the C2 seems to have enumerated. So we're now no longer at AAA dot stage. We're at BAA dot stage. And we can see here. That's right. There's a, a another DNS request at BAA dot stage. Press F9 again. We've got CAA dot stage. Let's go back to DNS query. We see the request to CAA. Let's go again, again, again. And it's literally going through the alphabet. And you can see why there's this uh, comparison now uh, for the letter Z to the lower portion of BL. So we see here in the EBX register, you can see the actual address changing or the value changing rather. Um, each and every time and it's going to look to see um, with the lower portion does it equal 7a and that's going to be when it gets to um, the letter z so you can see right now we're at y so it's, it, ebx is at 7a and therefore it's going to, then going to wrap around and go to a again uh, but the next it's going to kind of shift so we're now at cba um, dba EBA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're gonna enumerate this, the actual C2. And we didn't see that. That wasn't statically coded into the actual malware itself. So if we if we took the string value of what we saw in the ASCII representation just at face value, well, actually, we might not necessarily protect ourselves from all of the traffic that we need to actually block. We know that we need to take into account this enumeration of subdomain um, that uh, the DNS uh, queries are being performed with. So anyway, we could continue down this route and we can put all sorts of breakpoints and keep pulling apart this code to our heart's content. The main aim of this video was to kind of show you how to extract that uh, shellcode in the first place, how to put a wrap around it, so then you can stick it in your debugger and you can then pluck out some, some key information like we have done here today in order to identify exactly what's going on under the hood and therefore you can perform some additional analysis. And in this case, we know exactly what's going on. We know it's a, a Metasploit module and we know what the bad guys are up to now. So. Hopefully that's useful. Look forward to the next video with you guys as well. Thanks.